A warm welcome from Origin Ministries to everyone joining us for worship. My name is Colin Peckham and I have the privilege of leading Origin's teams in the UK and South Africa. The Origin Ministries group of organisations work in both countries as independent missions with a goal of uniting the church and telling people about Jesus. You can find out more about us at the website on the screen. Today we celebrate the greatest event in history. Usually, we would do this in person at the Usher Hall in Scotland's capital city. But this year, our second lockdown Easter, we join with believers from all over the world. After a year of lockdown, our hair may be longer, our patience wearing thinner, and our desire to be out of the house, sometimes a little overwhelming. So much has changed. But one thing has remained steadfastly unaltered. Christ is risen. This fact has united the church for 2,000 years. So whatever church you belong to today, if you are a follower of Jesus, we worship with you in unity, secure in the knowledge that the Father has raised Jesus from the grave, and one day we too will join him forever. As you may know, Origin works in partnership with Artists in Christian Testimony International, which is based in Tennessee. And when I'm in Nashville for our staff meetings or for conferences, I regularly attend Judson Baptist Church. We're pleased to be joined tonight by the pastor of that church, Dr. Jeff Mims, who will speak to us later. Also, throughout this event, there will be cameos by actors who will read letters written by prisoners in Scotland. Letters imagined to have been written by people who lived through the events of Jesus' death and resurrection, and written as part of a community project led by Sam Rowe, the actor who plays the prodigal son in one of our other outreach presentations. If you are watching the premiere on Easter Sunday 2021, feel free to jump into the chat and say hi or in the YouTube comments. You can also turn on the subtitles if you would find that helpful. There is no charge to attend this event, but if you would like to give to support this ministry, there will occasionally be a link on the screen, like this one and you can support us there. The link is also in the YouTube description below. But first, as we begin to reflect on the glory of God and his plan to save mankind, let's join with Reverend Ian MacDonald, Minister of Holy Trinity, Wester Hales in Edinburgh, for a reading and prayer. Then Job replied, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written down on a scroll that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. We praise and glorify you, O God. You are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that what Job saw in the distance as though looking through a darkened glass, we have seen. And we have heard that longing of his heart that there is a redeemer, Jesus, God's own son. He has suffered, he has died, and he has risen from the dead. Because he has died, we no more may die. Because our redeemer lives, Death's sting is nullified. His sufferings justified, our future certified. And we respond in worship. Though we are apart in space, yet we are united as one in the spirit. One church, one faith, one Lord. Receive this our Easter sacrifice of praise in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lead 
me, Jesus. Show me the cross. Let me fall down at the feet of my redemption's cost. I see the nails through your hands and feet. Labored skin and body torn And the blood falls from the King of Kings Crowned in a plate of thorns Such an act of love The world had never seen until the day you gave your life for me Lead me, Jesus Show me your fate You became all of my sin You died there in my place Have me look Deep in your eyes Amid the mocking Ridicule As you cry Father forgive them They know Not what they do So an act of love the world had never seen until the day you gave your life for me
blessed Savior, you did it all for me. My good page, grab some ink and write this down. My dear Alicia, warm regards to you on this most unusual of days. Whilst I was in Jerusalem, a local governor, one uh, pilot, sent a prisoner to me on charges of blasphemy and heresy, with a view that I would take responsibility for this man's fate. Does this governor think I am a fool? Someone who can be manipulated? This Galilean was accused of claiming to be the Messiah. He even out of, outwardly talked about it as such with, with true conviction. <laughs> he was an idiot. I had a good laugh at his expense. This man would overthrow me and the faith. But who would outwardly claim such things knowing that they would result in death? He was clearly a madman, a crazy person. I really wish I was not involved in these trivial matters. If the elders of Judea wanted him crucified, then let them make that decision. Oh, I really wish I was not involved in these light-hearted matters. New line. I know you had to leave because your mother was ill. I do hope you would return soon. This palace is a sewer of treason and rebellion and... Oh, I do get cranky when you're not here. Safe travels, Herod. P.S. Are there any good gladiator games where you are? I really wish there were some here.
the stars in the wintry sky. Joy of the Father, reach through the darkness, shine across the earth, send the shadows to fly. of the world from the beginning the tragedies of time were no match for your love from great heights of glory you saw my story God you entered in and became one of us Sing My dear Elizabeth, why am I even writing to you? I can barely hold the pen. But the room is silent and I'm alone here with my thoughts. And who else could I write to but you? Oh cousin, do you remember those days when we held each other in joyful embrace? When our lives were full of angels and the baby in your womb danced for joy? And now our lives are full of sorrow. I have screamed and cried all day. But now I am numb. Our boys are dead, Elizabeth. What hope is left? I find myself asking if these times were a mirage, a delusion, as so many gossips have scorned. I'm at a loss for understanding. Reassure me. I'm not losing my mind. Oh, 
Elizabeth. They nailed him to a cross. I was watching from afar, but near enough to hear his agony and cry, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words cut deep, Elizabeth, deep into me. When he was a child, it was I who told him of the angel's visit, who told him that God had a plan for his life. But as he hung there, the accusation came that I had lied to him, filled his head with my delusions. And there was no purpose, no rescue, no even a fear to write it, no God to hear his prayer. Just pain and the abyss. And if we have no hope for anything more than this, then where is the point in living? Elizabeth, how have you carried on after they killed your boy? We have grown distant over these years and now I see it as no wonder. Your son was gone, whilst mine still laughed, still lived, still walked, still put his arms around me. His smile still reflected in my eyes whilst yours were red with weeping. No wonder you could not bear to be around me. In grief, happiness is such a banality. But it makes us sisters again. And how I long to be beside you, to share our grief. They said our sons were many things. Elizabeth, Elijahs, Messiahs, frauds, heretics. But to us, they were just our sons. Our tiny little boys whose hands had gripped ours in the marketplace, whose skinned knees we had rubbed better as the fat tears rolled down their cheeks. Oh, take me back to that time, I pray. When I knew nothing of what was to come, let me treasure each moment a thousandfold more. For I did not know their value then. Let some miracle occur that will allow me once again to trust, to trust in the promises that were made. Let me not give up on God. Write to me, if you're able. Your words will be a comfort to me. Your cousin, Mary.
Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. my redeemer there is no more for heaven i to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this i hold my hope is only jesus for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All this are mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. By my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor all in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend. It has been paid for Jesus' blood and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold my sin has been defeated. Jesus now. To follow Jesus, for he has said, 
that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i Still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Peter, we have not always seen eye to eye, you and me. You are the leader among Jesus' followers. I respect that, and all I ask is that you offer me the same. Do not dismiss me or my testimony, or roll your eyes making out that I speak nonsense when others speak mysteries. Yes, I have seen you do that. The things I write to you now, and will explain more fully when I see you, are true. That they have been revealed to me, a woman, before they have been shown to you, a man, may be another challenge for your humility, but I urge you to accept them and to do as I ask. Today, not even an hour ago, I have witnessed events most strange and miraculous, events which have stirred me with joy yet shaken me with fear. The tomb is empty. I have just visited with my sisters and the stone was rolled back. When we entered, the grave clothes lay folded where his body had been. We questioned among ourselves what could have happened. Joanna became distressed, crying out that they could not leave his body at peace after all he had been through. Mary from Bethany, wrapped her in a comforting embrace when a man came forth from the back of the cave. Believe me when I say I have never seen a man before who looked this way, so full of beauty, yet with something terrifying in his aspect. And when he spoke, though it was but a whisper, it filled the whole cavern with an awesome sound. Truly, he was an angel. And he said to us, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. We looked at each other in amazement. Do you remember when Jesus said that he must be delivered into the hands of sinners? That he would be crucified and that on the third day he would rise again. Do you remember that? Remember how mad we all thought him? I had forgotten, even as he bled on the cross. That was not the part of the prophecy that was difficult to believe. I always feared that it was inevitable that day would come, but that the final part of what he said should be true. My faith was not strong enough to believe it. 
But when I looked into that stranger's eyes, I understood what God had done. And now I have seen it with my own eyes. I know it is not wise for us to be seen together, but we must meet. Gather the disciples in a place you know is safe, then meet me at the Essene gate at noon and lead me to them. I will explain more fully the things I have seen and been told. Excuse me writing to you in haste. The woman who brings you this note is known to me. You can trust her. Your friend, Mary Magdalene.
Father, I feel I must write to you urgently, as news of events here in Jerusalem has no doubt reached you. And if it has, then know that much of what you have heard is true. Jesus was crucified and put to death. I can only imagine what you must have thought when you heard. You thought I was a fool for following him, and I can only imagine how you were expecting me to return home, shamefaced and broken. But I want to let you know that I will not be coming home. For much has happened here that you will not have heard, not yet anyway, but one day it will be told around the world. I live in hope that these things will make you see truly who he was and is, Father. You see, I knew, I swear, I always knew. And when he asked me who I thought he was, I told him. I said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And you know what he said? He said, blessed are you, Peter, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. Can you imagine it, Father? But then he said something that I didn't understand. He said he must die at the hands of the elders and the chief priests. I cried out, never, Lord, I will never let that happen to you. And he rebuked me. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely those of humans. I didn't know what to say. But I knew that in knowing who he was, I must just continue to follow him wherever he led me. And now it has happened just as he said. And that was not the only thing he said that came true. He said I would deny him. Again, I said that I would never deny him. I was his rock. He told me so. But then when he was arrested, I did it. I'm not ashamed to admit it because in my fault, his powers are revealed. You know me, Father. I'm sure you would be the first to say I'm a hothead. That I act without thinking. That passions rise up and take hold of me. Well, I was scared, really scared. I'd seen the guards take him off. I knew what they wanted to do with him. She was just a little girl who asked me first. She said, this man was with him. And I felt terror grip me as all eyes turned. And I said, I didn't know him. I did it twice more. Men kept passing and accusing me as I tried to slip into the crowd. And then I realized. And I wept then. How could I be his rock when I'm so weak? But he said that I am, so I must be. And there, there were yet greater things to come. He's risen, Father. Risen from the grave. Yes, it's true. As he had foretold. Uh, no doubt they'll spread lies about it and say it's not so. But they will have to kill me now before I will deny it. He sits here with us now in flesh and blood. I've shared meals with him. Father, if this letter will not make you believe, then come to us and see for yourself. It is my most fervent prayer that you would come to understand that God, in his great mercy on mankind, has given us new birth. A living hope through the resurrection of his son, this Jesus, this Jesus Christ. It's a new hope to be freed from shame and guilt and death. Yes, even death. For he's invited us to return with him to his heavenly home one day. When peace shall rule the earth. When perfect justice will be done. And where we shall see our true father face to face. And he will look upon us with his divine love. Because through his son's sacrifice upon the cross. He has forgiven us all our sin and error. Oh, what freedom this is. So come to me and believe my own dear father. Come to me and place your faith in the king of heaven and earth. Come and feel the peace of God live in you and know the promise that he will never leave your side. Your son, Simon Peter. One day you'll make everything new, Jesus. One day you will bind every wound. The former things shall all pass away, no more tears. One day you'll make sense of it all. Jesus, one day every question resolved Every anxious thought left behind No more fear 
When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. One day we will see face to face Jesus, is there a greater vision of grace? And in a moment we shall be changed on that day. And one day we'll be free, free indeed, Jesus, and one day face to face Jesus is there a greater vision of grace and in a moment we shall be changed yes in a moment we shall be changed in a moment we shall be changed on that day When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. We'll sing and shout the victory.
talk so God can use me anywhere alone anytime I'm gonna talk so God can use me anywhere alone anytime Happy Easter and welcome to this evening's service. I hope that I'm not the first person that has said he is risen to you today. In the Christian church, we often say he is risen and the response is he is risen indeed. And so today we are celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I bring you greetings from Nashville, Tennessee. My name is Jeff Mims and I was so grateful when Colin asked me to participate in this service and grateful that we could spend this time together as believers gathered all over the world, but specifically in Scotland tonight. And I just pray God's greatest blessings on you today. You know, as Christians, we often celebrate Easter, and it's for us really the greatest celebration. We, we often think maybe that Christmas is the greatest celebration, and I think that's because it's a longer season so many times, and it it has other things and trappings around it, but we recognize as Christians, don't we, that without the resurrection that we celebrate on Easter, Christmas really is just a neat story. And so today we do celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I want to just spend this moment with you and the time that we have to think about how we often think about the different ways that people really believe Jesus was either a teacher or they think that Jesus was maybe a prophet. Some people think that Jesus was just a historical figure. Some people think that he had delusions of grandeur with kind of a God complex that he, he never quite got right. But if we're going to really understand who Jesus is, I believe it's helpful for us to look at what Jesus said about himself. Because if we do that, we can see some things that Jesus said about himself that really eliminate for us some of the things that we might perceive Jesus to be. Because if he doesn't believe those things about himself, then, then really we have to examine our beliefs about him in a different light. If you go to the Gospel of John, you can open your Bibles there. Today we'll be in John chapter 11. But 
the whole gospel of John, Jesus made some statements about himself. He said these I am statements. These are interesting to me because they give glimpses for us to understand who he is. There were seven of them. We'll look at one today as it relates to him being the resurrection. But really, they all have something for us. Jesus said, for instance, that I am uh, the, the bread of life. I'm the light of life. I'm the door or the gate. He said, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection. And then he said, I'm the way and I am the vine. When you think about those, what does that make you think about? Does it make you have a clear understanding? Maybe tonight you, you don't even know who Jesus is. Well, I want us to look at a story where Jesus said about himself, not me saying it about him. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he said it to one of his very good friends who was experiencing a great crisis in her life. Her brother had died. Her name was Martha. And Jesus was great friends of Martha and her brother Lazarus, who was deceased, and her sister Mary. They were really, really tight. Not just that Jesus knew them, but he had spent time in their home. He had spent time hanging around the table and fellowshipping with them and eating with them. He was uh, just moved with compassion when he heard that their brother had died, that Lazarus had died. This was not just somebody he knew of. He knew them intimately and I want us to read this story from John chapter 11, verse 17. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, less than two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus answered her and said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. Martha was experiencing something that I believe we all experience in relationships she had some unmet expectations. If you have ever been in relationship, you know exactly what this is like because we have entered those relationships with expectations that a lot of times have not been met. And maybe that's your expectations as a parent towards your children. And you have an expectation of how they should react to you and, and respond to you when you speak to them. Or maybe it's the expectations you have for your employees or if you're an employee for your employer, you have an expectation of how you should be treated in the workplace. And, and when those are unmet, it's really frustrating. Oftentimes, we have unmet expectations of our governmental leaders. We've certainly been experiencing tumultuous times. You've experienced those as we've been in the pandemic, and our governmental leaders have made decisions, and sometimes we've agreed with them, and sometimes we have not agreed with them. And our expectations have been a little bit unmet. Well, Martha had an unmet, unmet expectation here with Jesus because when her brother had been sick, Martha sent some messengers to Jesus and said, the guy that you love, Lazarus, your friend, is sick. And Jesus didn't stop what he was doing and run and attend to this family. Martha's expectations weren't met. In fact, in verse 21, she said to Jesus, if you had been here, then I know that my brother wouldn't have died. You could have healed him. She had seen Jesus heal others. She believed in the power of healing. She understood that Jesus was a teacher. He was a healer. She understood all of those things. And she had an expectation that if Jesus had come, her brother would still be alive. Every time I read verse 21, 
where she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I sense from Martha that there's not just an unmet expectation, but there's faith and doubt all mixed in at once, isn't there? There's faith in this man, Jesus, that if he had come, the outcome would have been different. And yet, on the other hand, there is disbelief because it's, it's kind of like, well, why didn't you come? I mean, if, if you could have been here, I do believe that you could have made a difference in the outcome for my brother, but you didn't come. Why didn't you come? What happened here? And where does that leave me now? Maybe you have experienced the same feelings in relationship to God or Jesus because you've wondered why God didn't answer a prayer or you've wondered why it doesn't feel like God has intervened perhaps in the way that you had thought he might in the midst of a global pandemic or you've experienced economic loss or you've experienced relational loss through these seasons that we've been in. And I would just remind you of this, just because God didn't meet your expectation didn't mean that God wasn't in the crisis with us because God never wastes a crisis. He's not wasting a global pandemic. He's not unaware of what's going on in our lives. But in the midst of our crises, God shows up and reveals something about himself that we may not have seen before. We may not have understood it before. And in the midst of that, God's showing us something. And that's exactly what God was doing for Martha. Martha wanted something instantaneously. And Jesus had something bigger. Spoiler alert. She raised, he raised her brother, rather, from the dead. He raised her brother from the dead. That, that's the spoiler alert to this. He was doing something bigger than that. He could have shown up and healed her brother, but he had something bigger in mind. But he really wanted Martha to see something about his character and who he was that was important for her to know right now in the middle of that. And that was that she could be raised to life. Let's read verses 23 and 24 again. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. And Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha had been taught about the resurrection. The Jews believed that the resurrection was going to happen. There was a small group of them that did not, and they were identified as the Sadducees. They did not believe in a physical bodily resurrection at the day of judgment. They didn't think that was going to happen. But Martha had been taught this, and she knew that was coming. And for many of us, we look at our relationship with Jesus, and we see it rightfully so with bifocal lenses. I don't wear bifocals. My glasses are, are actually for me to see a distance. But if you wear bifocals, you know that they bring things sharp in clarity for you in, in the close-up, but they also help you see in the distance. And our relationship with Jesus is that way, isn't it? Because when you're saved this morning, there's so much of what happens is for the future. We know that the promises of God are still being fulfilled in our lives in the future, eternity. When we will be with God in His presence in heaven and sin will be no more and time will cease to exist and we will live with Him in glory, that so much of our salvation is off in the future. But Jesus was saying to her and saying to us that salvation comes to us and it does something for us now. And that's that we can be raised to life now, dead, though we were in our trespasses and sins, we can have peace with God the Father and be raised to life now. And that's exactly what happens when any one of us encounters the living God and recognizes our own sin and repents of that sin. Repent means to have a, a change of direction, a change of mind. So I was living towards sin and now I'm living towards God through Christ that I believe something about Him and I place my faith and trust in Him to save me. And the Scripture says that we're raised from death or we were dead and we're raised to life. And Jesus is saying to her, when we believe in who He says that He is, not that He's a moral teacher. Of course He was a moral teacher. Not that just He was a prophet or a historical figure. All of those things are true. He didn't have a God complex, though, because he was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He is reigning as the Son of God now because 
He was dead and he was brought to life. And he's saying to Martha, he is the resurrection. And for those of us who believe in him, we will be raised to life instantly to walk in new life. But though we may die, we will yet live with him in eternity. And that's kind of the big question, isn't it? Because Jesus asked her in verse 27, or, or, or verse 20, I guess I should say verse 26, do you believe this, that I am the resurrection and the life? And in verse 27, Martha gets it right. Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes in to the world. Isn't that the greatest question that we're still answering today? It's a personal question. Your church may have answered it right. Your parents may have answered it right. Your grandparents may have answered it right. But it's a personal question. Do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? The son of God who came and lived a sinless, perfect life. Was crucified on the cross for your sins. My sins. And that he was raised to life on the third day, he is risen. And any of us that come to him experience resurrection life here and now and in eternity. Oh, church today. That means so much to us because we're not just looking for some pie in the sky, something that's going to happen in the future. Yes, our hearts and our minds are bent towards heaven and all the promises of God that are ours, they have yet to be realized, but they are ours. We are sure of those things. We're sure of His second coming. We're sure of eternity. We're sure of heaven. But, but the resurrected life in us right now means that we're living an overcoming life. That we're living a life that is filled with joy because we have met the Messiah. And I ask you this question, have you met Him? Have you truly met the Messiah? The Bible says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Have you ever called on Jesus to save you from your sins? If you haven't done that today, I pray before you leave this, this time of, of our virtual gathering that you would reach out to one of us so that we can share with you how you can know Jesus Christ and the power of His resurrection being raised from dead or death to life. And know that you have been saved. I'm so grateful that we serve a risen Savior. Not just someone we look back on in history, but someone we live with now and look forward to because the best days of the church, the best days of our lives are right in front of us as we walk with Jesus. God bless you this Easter Sunday. I hope that you live with the joy of the resurrection this week and that it makes a difference in your life because you're serving the risen Savior.
Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all, maybe? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? don't know Jesus in the way Jeff Mims was describing and you would like to know more about following him, more about what living life in the light of the resurrection could mean to you, we'd love to put you in touch with a good church in your area. And if you're in the UK or South Africa, send you some more information in the post. Drop us an email to the email address on the screen with any questions you may have. It would be our privilege to serve you in this way.
I want to say a big thank you to all the participants in this Easter Sunday service. God willing, next year we plan to be back in the Usher Hall, but there are many more online events on our YouTube channel and more to come. So just click on the subscribe button and you'll be notified of new ones when they happen. Also, if you'd like to support the ministry and the not inconsiderable expenses of events like this, you can go to the link on the screen. Thank you to those who have done this over the last year. Your partnership has meant we are able to continue sharing the good news around the world. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Let's rejoin Ian MacDonald, who will pronounce the benediction and bring this event to a close. We have all known weakness and powerlessness this past year. But the promise of Scripture is that Christ will take these weak mortal bodies of ours and turn them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power that raised him from the dead and that he will use to bring everything under his control. And so now, may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love and cherish and all God's people here and everywhere, both now and forevermore. Amen. Here's love. Here's love. From the dead, he is Lord. And every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ.